You know, Ephesians 3.20 says something beautiful. It says that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God wants to activate that power, His power in your life and do the exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think in your life. Let's pray about that. Precious Heavenly Father, that's what we want. We want your exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think working in our lives. But we realize, Lord, it's according to the power that works in us. So right now, Lord, we open up our hearts and we say, God, work in us. Activate your power in us. That faith that comes alive in Jesus' precious name. Amen. True Grit, part four. Oh my goodness, this has been such an awesome series just to revive our hope and our faith even through the fires of life and know that God is for us, not against us. The psalmist said that the Lord marches with us. He marches with you. Praise God. I have to tell you that I really like our video intro that Stan's put together for this series called True Grit. It's got spiritual weight to it. The imagery resonates with the theme of this series. It's not passive, but it is aggressively faith-filled, faith-activated, forged in the fire a people after God's own heart with True grit. Isn't that the image? True grit. Here we go. Part four, and we're going to dial in on character. Character, integrity, and character. You know, character and integrity are essential to your life if you're going to live out your true identity. That's right. Probably one of the most impactful contemporary statements ever made on this subject, coming from a man who truly lived a life of true grit, was Martin Luther King Jr. when he famously said this, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Oh my goodness, MLK knew the importance of character and the ability to measure it, to assess it, to actually judge it. Our society today, it runs from that idea because inflation has made the cost of character just too high, right? Oh, but thank God for his powerful virtue, God's virtue in us, supplying that power for true grit. Don't quit true grit. Okay, let's first touch on a quick review so far. This series has not steered away from the reality of trouble, trials, tribulation, has it? But at the same time, it's not this broke down, poor me, doormat theology where believers are assigned to a victim ID. Absolutely not. And thank God for that. Jesus didn't die on a cross and raise up from the grave to be seated in heaven at the right hand of God the Father so that you and I could live under at the bottom, weak and broken. No siree. Jesus is the king of kings, not the king of fools. He's not the king of a sorry bunch of whiners that run from every fight and embrace losing like it's a merit badge. It's not. Jesus paid full price to make us winners, overcomers in him, strong in the Lord. In fact, just before we do a quick review, Let's take a look at this earth-shaking Bible verse. I love this, Romans 5, 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace and the free gift of righteousness reign. Say that with me. Reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Praise God. Oh, my friend, this is why we're talking about true grit. You need spiritual grit to reign as a king in life by Jesus Christ. True grit sets you up not to surrender to every temptation to be mastered by the sin, but true grit sets you up to not drop your faith and walk in your feelings. You're called to reign in life by Jesus Christ, but that requires the maturity that shows up in those that have true grit. True grit means you don't give in to your insecurities and try to reign over other people. But grit helps you do the right thing and serve people, love people, refuse to be offended by people when you're mistreated, and instead let the steel, I said the steel of your character, shine in the light because you got it. Ah, you guessed it. True grit. Boom. 
Mmm. Yeah, we needed to see that hammer come down one more time, didn't we? <laughs> I like that. So here's what we've discovered so far. Quick review. Part one was never give up. Talent's not the big deal. We all make it out to be. And the race is not to the swift, the Bible says, nor the battle to the strong. The real master key that opens great doors to success is the never give up quality of true grit, tenacity, consistency. We read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Add to your faith virtue. <laughs> grit. Part two, we hammered on the theme. Hold on. Sister, brother, loved one that God is speaking to this very second. You want to hold on. Your life matters. So don't you dare give up and walk away. Hold on. Grab on to God's promises. We learn that God doesn't call us to an ignorant, mindless grit, but the God kind of tenacity that's calibrated for our needs. We doubled down on this key scripture of truth that we read in both part one and part two, but it's Galatians 6 verse 9. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and at the appointed season, we shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. Then in part three, we said, it ain't the pain, it's the gain. You see, it's all about your focus. Are you fixated on the pain or focused on the gain? Jesus endured horrific pain for us at the cross, but Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that it was for the joy, the reward set before him. That's right. Jesus endured the pain all for the gain. We close part three being very practical as we even talked about not chasing things or pursuing answers that you really don't want to spend your grit on. Life is all about focus, my friend. It ain't the pain, it's the gain. So make sure it really is gain for you and not some distraction from God's bigger plans for you. And I hope that you've had a chance to get this, the seven steps of true grit for faith that won't quit. You can get that on the Living Room Church app. Now, let's land this series on part four, character. We're talking about character. Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States, said this, to educate a man in the mind and not in the morals is to educate a menace to society. Look around. You don't have to look too far to see that we've wholesale financed the organization of multiple mobs at war against society. No integrity, no morals, no character. And to a great degree, I must confess that we, the North American group of Christians, we've done this by lowering the bar of morality and we call it grace. We're to be salt and light in this world. We don't go along and we're not called to just get along. You're called to be strong, to have moral grit. That means character, not compromise. We've traded in moral backbone for being nice because maybe we thought it would pump up the numbers. I'm not sure. Now the mob is in the street, my friend. Did you know that the word nice, by the way, comes from the Anglo-French meaning stupid and ignorant? Let's not bother being nice, right? Let's be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hmm. God's got far more for us, doesn't he? Say that, God's got far more for me. That's right. Tim Tebow, famous athlete, NFL star, author, speaker, he said this, your value is not determined by your success on the field, but by who you are as a person. He's pointing to character here, not performance, but character. I think if there's one major struggle I've noticed with Christians is that they easily get caught up in what they do. What I mean is their attention becomes focused on their performance, whether for good or for bad. People want to be faithful on Team Jesus, right? So they pursue what's right, but often the wrong way. They slyly get pulled into the vortex of everything they're doing, how they're performing, how they're failing or succeeding, and everything that they should be doing better or are doing great performance. So doing right becomes this futile exercise in self-righteousness. Here's the biblical problem with that mindset. It's wrong. 
the focus is all wrong. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, he said, I will build my church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship, God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Psalm 92 verse 4 says, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your works, your works. It's not about what we do. It's all about what he do. He's the creator. He's the author. He's the maker. We didn't make ourselves and we definitely can't save ourselves from sin and failure. Even when it comes to eternity, Jesus specifically said that he was going to prepare a place for us. Let's face it, we're pretty needy. And when it comes to God and his saving, redeeming plan, we're needy. I already mentioned this verse quickly, but let me say it again in its entirety. Ephesians 2 verse 10. I want you to look at this. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined for us, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Oh, that's amazing. So you heard it just like I did. We are God's handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus. We got a remake because we needed our design repaired and redeemed from our sinful, broken condition. Now, let me be clear with you. When you make the choice to believe on the Lord Jesus, you are instantly a child of God with full access to all of his family benefits. That's great. The Bible makes clear that your faith in him makes you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus now. You don't earn it or achieve it. You simply receive it. Now, that said, there is a process of maturing and growing in faith that suddenly is before you, in front of you. It's the, the faith race, we call it. We all need to be trained to reign in Christ Jesus. We have to unlearn worldly thinking to utilize the mind of Christ. It's not easy. It requires true grit because faith is tested. 1 Peter 1 verse 7, so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested, your faith which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold which is tested and purified by fire, this proving of your faith is intended to redound to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So let me give you one more scripture that helps us understand that heat and pressure is not meant to destroy you, but God can use it to bring a purity and quality out in your faith and out of your heart. Proverbs 17, verse three. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tries the hearts. I saw a poster one day that said this, I'd walk through fire from my best friend. Well, not fire because, you know, that's dangerous, but a, but a super humid room. Well, not too humid because, you know, my hair. <laughs> that's what I say to Pam almost every time we fly into Florida. <laughs> the fire can work for us when God is with us. The world considers silver and gold very precious, rare elements on earth. We put a great value on these metals. God, on the other hand, he uses gold for asphalt in heaven. But your heart, your soul, Jesus once said was worth more than all the world. More than all the world. That's Matthew 16, 26. In fact, Proverbs 22, 1 says that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor more than silver and gold. So, the trying of your heart, the testing of your faith. Why? Why? Character. To bring out the character and the integrity. We know Jesus paid the price for your salvation. Being a child of God is the outcome of believing on him. We couldn't save ourselves, so Jesus did. But growth is not automatic. Having character and a good name is not a gift or automatic. You make a choice for it. You invest for it. Having your mind renewed is a matter of repeated choice where you set your mind on things above. You do this. This is a work you do. God does the work of shaping and creating with his word, but you do the work of setting your mind, showing up, paying attention, exercising grit to endure the process 
And yes, it is a process that utilizes heat, pressure, affliction, endurance, patience. Your life has amazing potential when it's tempered. Say that, that word tempered. You see, that's a word that's not frequently used anymore. It's the verb temper. In Webster's Dictionary, it's defined as to make stronger and more resilient through hardship. It points to a process of repeated heating and cooling, then heating and cooling over and over. I'll say it again. Your life has amazing, amazing potential, use, character when it's tempered. The Roman Empire is famous for many reasons, but probably one of the greatest was for having the most powerful army in the world. Of course, their discipline and leadership was a key to their success, but the superior quality of their weapons cannot be understated. Roman steel was absolutely famous and coveted. A Roman sword was known to be nearly unbreakable in the chaos of war. Why? Because it was tempered properly tempered. The Roman army would have contracts with the top blacksmiths to forge their steel. The blacksmith would beat the blade of the sword on his anvil. He'd heat it up in the fire. He'd cool it in the oil. Then he'd begin the whole process all over again. Beat that steel tirelessly on the anvil, fire it in the forge, and then cool it in the oil. The blacksmith could easily identify weak spots in his steel when he brought the sword to a high temperature again in the forge. It would glow orange, but weak spots would show up darker so that he could target those areas and beat them over and over on his anvil until the spot cleared out in the next firing. The artesian would work this process on his valuable steel until the sword glowed bright orange with not a single dark area of compromise. Dropping it in the cold water, the steel was now properly tempered. That's right, tempered for use, use in war. Now, not to get too technical, the process of forging and tempering steel basically brings the molecules of the metal closer together so it becomes harder and stronger. That's what the process is all about. It was part of the contract that the Roman blacksmiths had that they would finish their work by engraving their seal or mark in the sword so that the army knew exactly who forged this steel. Now, why was that so important? Well, the contract the soldiers had with the blacksmith was such that if for any reason the steel broke in battle, their sword broke in battle, the soldier had the right to have the blacksmith executed. Wow, talk about a money back guarantee, right? Now that's a serious warranty. So let's apply this whole principle to you, to your life. My friend, listen to me. Salvation is the gift of God. It's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's a gift from God and not by any works of yours, so there can be no boasting on our part. But being a child of God is just the beginning of living the blessed life. God wants to do things with you. He wants to involve you in his kingdom activity and kingdom work. For that to happen, you need to develop character. Character is not a gift. Salvation is a gift. Character is not. You need to be tempered, and it's a process. The steel of your character needs to be worked, heated, cooled, hammered, and then that submitted again and again, over and over. God's character is shaped in you, but it's brought out of you. Galatians 4 verse 19, listen to this. My little children, for whom I am again suffering birth pains until Christ is completely and permanently formed, molded within you. When you've got Jesus in you, you have the character of Christ in you, but his character and integrity need to be infused throughout your being. That's a process in the heat. You know, I like tea. One of my favorites is Earl Grey tea. Did you know that you need very hot water to bring the delicious flavor out of the tea? If the water is not hot, the process of infusion just will not work. And the hotter the water, the quicker the release of the flavor. God wants to use you to bring kingdom flavor throughout this world, and it's going to require some heat. 
True grit and heat, my friend. You've got gold in who you are, but it needs to be brought out, purified, refined, separated from the useless dirt that's unprofitable. When we get saved, we're loved children of God, but we all have contaminants and unprofitable things in us that need to be separated from our character. Stuff like our opinions, our bad attitudes, impatience, selfish, immature ways, you know, all the fun stuff that you tolerate, but God doesn't. What am I saying? Character is essential. Dr. Miles Monroe, the late great leadership expert and author and pastor, he said this, character is who we are when no one else is watching. You might be thinking, oh no, my secret life when no one is watching is a mess. Like, don't, listen, don't go all dark on me. Don't condemn yourself. Nothing good is going to come out of that. But I want you to understand this though. When you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, the seeds of God's character are in you, but they need to germinate. They need to grow and have room to grow. It's not that you don't have character. It's that you're not prioritizing it, celebrating it, and setting your mind on things above to grow it. Stupid thinking will always lead to stupid living. It's a law of life. Good character is gold. You've got God's image. And with Jesus, you've got the gold. But I believe you're understanding truth here. It must be mined and refined. God hides blessings for you, not from you. As we learn from the Romans, your steel must be tempered. What else or how else can I say this? Your guitar and your piano need some healthy tension. Tension makes music, my friend. Perfect tension. Great sound is impossible on a guitar or a piano without tension. Perfect tension makes for an amazing sounding instrument. Not enough tension and the sound is weak, indistinguishable, uncertain. It's not pretty, it's actually ugly. People living without healthy tension are unmotivated, dull, unstimulated, without direction, too much tension, and that gives an unnatural strain sound until the string actually pops, it breaks. People living in this state often pressure talk. They pressure talk. They pressure text. It's in their voice. They're breaking too much tension. That's why we need perfect tension. It brings the character out of the instrument. You're an instrument. True grit is the factor that helps us regulate proper tension. Have you ever noticed when pressure is applied to people of character, something good rings in the air, something certain and inspiring, something of value and even beautiful rings out. True grit helps you so that you don't walk away from the challenges, give up on God, give up on you. Good character equips you to know what you're not assigned to, what's not your problem, what's none of your business, and the grit to manage the tension. Character is the ability to recognize calibrated pressure. Your tires function smoothly and perfectly when they have what? Air pressure in them. Not too much, not too little, but the calibrated pressure the manufacturer's standard calls for. Pressure makes the ride smooth. Isn't that amazing? Without calibrated pressure, you're on the side of the road. The tire's ability to hold the calibrated pressure is an ability to not let go. That's character, and that's true grit. True grit. How about an internal combustion engine? It converts pressure in its cylinders for displacement, which basically gives us work, power, torque, speed, something called horsepower. Think about this. Controlled pressure works for you. If you have a crack in your engine block and the pressure escapes, you have no power, no torque. I know some guys that know about that. Calibrated pressure in life is your friend, but you need true grit. Otherwise, you've only got a blown engine, no character. If your character has a cracked head gasket, the pressure isn't being used to create power and torque. It's just leaking into the atmosphere. Solid character is ensuring that the integrity of our person is whole, healed, made complete by Christ's work in us. In our first birth, our original state, we're fractured, we're cracked, we're born in sin. When we accept Christ in us, we receive his person, therefore his character restoration program. But then the work of alignment begins. And every step of the way, it requires our choice to submit, receive, grow, and refine. 
Still, that is a conscious decision on our part to let go of what we were and trust God to rebuild us in his shop. That requires true grit. Added to your faith because the infusing process of character throughout our being is a process. Sometimes a very, very hot, intense, pressure-inflicting process. In other words, it ain't easy. But God does give us grace, doesn't he? That's what grace is for. Empowerment to overcome, endure, and engage our godly tenacity. If you remember in part one, I spoke about when a sponge is squeezed, it soaks up whatever it's around. Character is essential. Character is essential because when you're squeezed and you run into God's presence, you take advantage of your pain. You take advantage of the pressure and the affliction because close to God, you soak up his amazing character for life. I hope and I pray this series has helped persuade you that it's God's will for you to have true grit. When the steel of your character is forged by the master, he makes you strong, flexible, powerful, profitable in his designs. Let's pray together about this. Dear Lord Jesus, just say this. I want your character in me. I am your workmanship. Help me to understand. You can work all things for my good. I can rejoice in every situation because you're at work in me. You are my Savior. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit, your overcoming character. Imprint the family name on my heart. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.